Good morning and hello to everybody from Oslo. Welcome to this uh, webinar on visions for offshore renewable energy production, the fourth part uh, in uh, this year's German-Norwegian Energy Dialogue. My name is Tor Christian Haldorsen, and I will, together with my colleague Hanne-Marit Grønningstrand, guide you through this uh, session today. This energy dialogue is uh, planned in cooperation with uh, the German Embassy in Oslo, the Norwegian Embassy in Berlin, as well as uh, Innovation Norway. We're also very grateful for the support from uh, our partners, Agda Energi, DNV, Equinor, Hydro, RWE Renewables, Startkraft, Startnet, and Tenet. So offshore wind plays an important role in the EU Green Deal. We also saw last year that Germany, as one of the most important EU member states, uh, increased its ambitions for uh, offshore wind, uh, aiming to reach 40 gigawatt capacity by 2040. Meanwhile, here in Norway, our government is uh, preparing to open up two areas on the Norwegian continental shelf for offshore wind production, uh, Utsira Nord and Sørlige Nord Sjø 2, uh, and with a capacity of uh, four and a half gigawatts. In addition to this, last year's many hydrogen strategies indicate that it could be necessary to produce large amounts of hydrogen offshore. So against this background, we ask, which visions should we have for offshore renewable energy production? And how may Germany and Norway benefit uh, from closer cooperation? But before we go on to answer this question, um, my colleague, Hanna Maret Grønningstrand, will um, give some practical information. Thank you to Christian for this uh, introduction. <clears throat> Let us start with some practical information. Uh, this webinar is recorded and you will receive the link for the recording after the webinar. Uh, if you have any questions, you may uh, post them in the chat box uh, on the right side of your screen. We will follow the chat during the webinar um, and we will try to include them in the discussion as we go forward. Last week, Equinor, Hydro and RWE Renewable uh, announced their consortium on the Sörli Norsjö 2 project, which is a great example of German-Norwegian energy cooperation. We will meet two of these companies today, Equinor and RWE Renewables. And both of them, together with Siemens Gamesa, will also be uh, represented here today. They have a strong interest in the development of new offshore projects. They will present their visions for how to ramp up uh, offshore renewables and how it should be planned, regulated and developed. With us today, we also have two clusters who will present their thoughts on where on German, German and Norwegian, Norwegian suppliers, suppliers could benefit, could benefit from closer cooperation. But first, we will, we will begin, begin with a keynote, keynote presentation, presentation on the status, status prospects, prospects and challenges of offshore renewable, renewable energy, energy in, <coughs> sorry, in Europe in and in particular in, uh, in the North and Baltic Seas. Seas. We, give we give a warm welcome, welcome to Gunnar Herzig, who is the is managing the director, director and co-founder of the World, World Forum Offshore, Offshore Wind. Wind. This is this a non-profit non organization, organization founded, founded to promote, promote offshore wind offshore energy, energy worldwide. worldwide. Unfortunately, Gunnar Hedzig will only be with us in the first part of the webinar. So if you have any questions, be quick to answer them. So now, uh, Mr. Hedzig, I am very happy to welcome you and uh, I give the word to you. And yeah, thank you very much again for inviting me today. Great pleasure to be talking about the wind in the North and Baltic Seas. 
And let me just start with a quick introduction of our organization. So the World Forum Offshore Wind is a non-profit organization founded in 2018, and its members represent the complete offshore wind value chain, and we have an international setup with offices in Hamburg and Singapore. And our single target is to promote offshore wind energy worldwide. And what do we do exactly? So we advise governments and regulatory bodies on offshore wind. We inform the global community about offshore wind and we connect players from around the world with regards to offshore wind in order to exchange uh, offshore wind ideas and thoughts. In terms of members, we by now have more than 60 members from around the world. And as you can see, a great variety of members, including utilities, manufacturers, service firms, other organizations such as Norweb uh, from Norway or VAP from Germany. So really it would be great to have such a broad coalition of members on board. Yeah, and now let me jump straight into um, the offshore wind presentation. And let me start with this yeah, kind of comparison of changing views of offshore wind over the past years, because that still gives us of how comparatively young offshore wind as an industry still is and what tremendous progress it has made over the past couple of years. And as you can see, two articles from The Economist. And back in 2014, The Economist stated um, that with regards to the UK, which was back then already in offshore wind, um, it was actually a world leader at something rather dubious so offshore wind was referred to as something rather dubious and as staggeringly expensive. But then interestingly, only three years later, in 2017, The Economist um, confirms that by now or by then, offshore wind was an adolescent industry and there had been a stunning drop in the costs of offshore wind and that with only, uh, within only three years. So that already gives you an idea of the dramatic progress that we've made over the past couple of years and of the progress that is yet to come over the next couple of years. And to kind of set the scene of where we are at the moment with regards to operational offshore wind capacity, let me just show you this quick chart which captures operational capacity around the world by the end of 2020, so end of last year. And here we can really see this steady growth path over the past 10 years which increased roughly by 10 times since 2011. And by the end of 2020, we had 32% of global capacity. And in terms of individual offshore wind farms, that meant 162 offshore wind farms around the world. At this point, the majority is still in Europe, of course, but Asia and also the US are now catching up. And we can see the concrete distribution on the next slide where you can see the total installed capacity by country and also the capacity that was recently added, so last year. And here we can see that we have pretty um, clear three front runners: the UK, which is still the biggest offshore wind market, with more than 10 gigawatts installed by the end of last year, then Germany, and then closely followed by China in third place. But soon China is going to be in second place and even in first place, uh, quite soon, so we can really see this dynamic development um, of the world. And um, yeah, interestingly, at this point, Norway has still a slightly modest uh, capacity of two megawatts in place, but of course, that's going to change. And that brings us to the very exciting news we've heard from Norway, also from Norway and Germany over the past couple of weeks and months. And I think the big announcement definitely was that Norway is now ready to conduct its first offshore wind tender. So I think very positive and spectacular news for the industry. It's now really going to launch its own offshore wind um, tender. And I think the, the very yeah, uh, um, impressive rationale here clearly is to help its oil and gas industry to transition slightly away from oil and gas towards offshore wind, because in terms of electricity, yeah, would not really need the electricity since it's very comfortably covered uh, by hydroelectric um, uh, power. But of course, in order to yeah, make sure this transition is being uh, supported, I think a very yeah, strategic and very uh, um, remarkable move to actively uh, help. With then we also had the 
great news that RWE from Germany and Equinor and Hydro from Norway have teamed up to really build new offshore wind farms off the coast of Norway. So great Norwegian-German collaboration that was announced here with heavyweights from the industry. So this really credibly, I think, underlines the, the seriousness of Norway's offshore wind ambitions. And then the last news, which was also fantastic, is about the Nordlink interconnector, because all the electricity um, you can produce doesn't really make sense if you cannot transport it to demand centers and really make sure electricity is being taken off wherever it's needed. And since Norway does already have a great um, yeah, uh, production of uh, renewable electricity with its, all its hydroelectric fleet, the interconnector between Norway and Germany makes perfect sense to uh, have the potential to export any surplus offshore wind electricity um, or generally any electricity from Norway to Germany or the other way around. So that's always something of great importance to have these interconnectors between countries and therefore that excellently feeds into the overall strategy of having more offshore wind in Norway. And yeah, now let me also kind of tell you about three major trends that we currently see in the offshore wind industry and trends that have really shaped the industry and have massively contributed to where we are today. And the first big trend, of course, is the turbine size and the growth in turbine sizes that we've seen for offshore wind. Um, and yeah, that has really majorly contributed to the cost reduction that we've seen and also really, yeah, underline the engineering behind an offshore wind farm if we're talking about offshore wind turbines yeah in sort of heights comparable to the eiffel tower or the sharp building in london as you can see on the slide so sizes and dimensions that would be very difficult to install onshore due to the visual impact but then offshore is possible and can really massively then contribute to cost reductions because if we have a look at the development over time um, with regards to how many individual turbines were needed to produce a fixed amount of, let's say, 30 megawatts. You can really see the clear trend that we've seen over the past 10 years. Back in 2010, in the very early days of the offshore wind industry, the Siemens, the Siemens 3.6 megawatt turbine was the kind of standard for any offshore wind farm. And with that capacity, 3.6 megawatt per turbine, you needed roughly 10 turbines to reach 30 megawatts. And indeed, some of the early offshore wind farms um, did have that kind of setup. Um, and then things already developed quite quickly. By 2015, we already saw the first five and six megawatt turbines. And then the number of individual turbines already dropped by 50%. So only five turbines were required. Currently, we're talking about turbines in the range of 8, 9.5 megawatts, and you only need three turbines. And then, of course, in only a few years, we'll have four megawatt turbines, and that reduces the number of turbines required even further. And that really kind of shows that the less turbines you have, the less installation effort you need, the kind of the, the, um, yeah, the less maintenance is required because the number of individual turbines that can fail, that can use any outages is reduced. So that really kind of explains the, yeah, the great progress that is made from this increase in turbine size. And yeah, that has really been quite uh, impressive over the past 10 years. And then of course, the next trend that we see in the industry and one that is particularly relevant to Norway is of course floating offshore wind because floating offshore wind really eliminates the physical yeah, kind of uh, uh, limit that we currently have for bottom fixed offshore wind which is the water depth so anything beyond yeah, 50 60 meters does get very challenging for bottom fixed so permanently installed offshore wind turbines and anything beyond that would require floating turbines which are just connected to the seabed via long mooring lines so they don't float away but otherwise they are not connected via the foundation to the seabed and that would then enable deep water markets such as Japan, California, Portugal, Spain or indeed Norway to make use of offshore wind energy and therefore we see this yeah, great development with more and more 
different uh, technical solutions coming up for large scale floating offshore wind farms. We, yeah, you can see a couple of um, technology providers on this slide. We have uh, EDL from France, which is now already called BW EDL, since they are a Norwegian um, oil and gas provider, uh, BW Offshore. So already here you can see the kind of trajectory that we're on, that oil and gas providers, oil and gas companies do realize that especially floating offshore wind is particularly relevant for them and could be a great future industry where gas companies can utilize all their uh, offshore oil and floating offshore oil and gas know-how because floating structures are extremely common in the oil and gas industry and using that great expertise for floating offshore wind could indeed be a great um, activity in the future. Therefore, the BW EDL partnership makes perfect sense with principal power as another technology provider, then Equinor itself um, as a major uh, oil and gas company has come up with its own design and is already leading in um, floating offshore wind with the High Wind Scotland project already for a couple of years very successfully. So I think that already shows really where the, the some of the oil and gas companies are going. And then we also have um, the move by Shell which acquired ALF, another French um, technology provider for floating offshore wind. So also Shell already clearly positioned with regards to building more and more floating offshore wind. And that is really an extreme uh, exciting development that we see right now with a few core markets around the world. Norway, of course, France as well, Japan uh, also, and actually California with the big announcement from the Biden administration only last week is also likely to become a very prominent spot for floating offshore wind. So this is definitely another big trend in the industry. And here you can see all the announcements for floating offshore wind that we've seen over the past couple of weeks. So all kinds of companies, whether it's the utilities or oil companies or technical um, technology providers, everybody now very much engaged in floating offshore wind. And the last trend is, of course, hydrogen and green hydrogen produced by offshore wind electricity. And that is actually also something that many companies are now thinking about how to couple hydrogen production facilities, um, so electrolysis um, facilities with offshore wind farms, whether it's onshore or actually offshore production of green hydrogen. But definitely another topic that is going to shape the next 10 years of offshore wind and indeed surely also something that Norway will explore um, and therefore, that is really a very exciting picture for the offshore wind industry. And I think everybody is extremely exciting to see what's going to happen in Norway and, of course, in the rest of the world. Uh, I think the next decade for offshore wind will really be extremely prosperous and very promising. So that brings me to the end of this keynote speech and very happy to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mr. Herzig, uh, for this very good introduction. Uh, we have uh, time for a very short question from, uh, from our side. Um, in your opinion, what would you say is the biggest uh, challenges uh, for offshore wind going forward in the years to come? Great question. So I think the, yeah, the biggest challenge always is to have a stable regulatory framework in place, because that's really for such large scale infrastructure investments, which cost yeah, several billions of euros. Nobody does those kind of investment if you don't have a stable regulatory framework in place that includes yeah, how to conduct the development process, the construction process, also the grid connection, how that is being dealt with. Um, and then yeah, what about the electricity remuneration? So really anything around the regulatory side of things needs to be in place and needs to be yeah, credibly um, uh, outlined before any serious investments will be made. Therefore, I would always yeah, say that it's, it's really about the regulatory frameworks that governments need to have in place in order to make sure they can really grow a domestic offshore wind industry. But thank you thank once you again want. for joining us. And uh, we will uh, continue the discussion. And uh, thank you uh, once again. Thanks again from me as well, uh, Mr. Herzig.
We now have to move on to the next session uh, where we invite some uh, of the companies that uh, have an interest in further offshore development. He's head of development offshore uh, in continental Europe, Scandinavia and the Baltics at RWE Renewables. Um, he is responsible for the development and construction projects and uh, who has, he has also been a project director for the Arcona offshore wind farm. Uh, Mr. Matisen, you will uh, share some thoughts on how the North and Baltic seas should be further planned and developed, and uh, you will also present your flagship project, the uh, Aquaventus, as an example of uh, what we could expect in the future. So, Holger, uh, I see that you're with us, so please go ahead when, uh, when you're ready. Yeah, thank you very much for the nice introduction, and uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm delighted to be invited to present here some thoughts regarding uh, offshore wind and the organization I'm working for, RWE Renewables. Let me just um, briefly say some words about uh, RWE, <clears throat> who is um, a global organization coming from conventional energy generation business, but is now quite clearly developing into a climate neutrality by 2040. That's the clear ambition. And here we have uh, several units, but uh, the unit I'm working for, RWE Renewables, is the one that is focusing on expanding renewable energy production, uh, onshore wind, offshore wind, photovoltaics and storage, um, as well as now hydrogen. We do have 3,500 employees in more than 20 countries. When it comes to offshore, we, we see ourselves as one of the global leaders in offshore wind. Um, and you do see the, uh, quite a large fleet of installed offshore capacities throughout Europe with 2.35 gigawatts of um, capacity. And we are also operating 800 megawatts additionally for uh, some of our partners. And we are uniquely positioned to drive a step change and uh, aim to take leadership roles throughout the entire industry. As we speak, we do have um, three projects in construction, Triton Null and Sofia in UK waters, as well as Kaskazi in German waters of the North Sea. We do have uh, a, a strong track record in developing and delivering complex projects as those offshore projects are on budget and in time. And we obviously like to expand our uh, portfolio um, not only across Europe, but also uh, in other markets like it is mentioned here, for example, Japan and Taiwan. Well, when I, when I focus a little bit on um, German-Norwegian cooperation, then to me, one of the prime examples that I'm also uh, personally involved in is the Arcona project, an offshore wind farm in the Baltic Sea, German waters that um, we jointly developed, constructed and operate uh, between RWE and Equinor. And you do see some pictures here from the construction period. Uh, this was for um, for quite a while the biggest uh, offshore wind farm in Baltic in the Baltic Sea, um, and has been built uh, ahead of schedule and below budget, which I think is quite remarkable for those uh, uh, large infrastructure projects, and to me is a prime example how German um, and Norwegian knowledge and and also intercultural um, uh, uh, talents can can uh, drive the industry forward. And, and as already mentioned by, by Gunnar Herzig, um, we, we try to bring this kind of spirit also now over to Norway, where we have uh, recently joined forces between Equinor, Hydro and RWE, and uh, we aim to to get uh, acreage in the SN2 area, um, but uh, and 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 we we believe that we have 
a lot of skills um, and uh, things to, uh, to bring to the table uh, to facilitate and initiate offshore wind in Norway. But uh, my, my colleague and, and partner, Anna Eich, uh, is going to uh, present that in more detail in his uh, presentation, which will follow afterwards. Um, I think one other element that was also mentioned uh, already is obviously uh, hydrogen. And uh, uh, I think here RWE can deliver uh, not only clean electricity, uh, but we can, we are also bring uh, a lot of skills to produce then green hydrogen from this clean electricity. And um, uh, we, we are uh, one of the leading producers of renewable electricity already. We do have the expertise that is required to produce green hydrogen inside our organization. And we can also, through our uh, trade house, uh, trade hydrogen nationally and internationally uh, using even our gas storage facilities uh, to place hydrogen uh, in uh, interim storage uh, places and also supply it to industrial buyers on demand. So all this would also help uh, ourselves uh, for our target to be climate or carbon neutral by 2040. And on, on this slide here, you, you do see that we have quite a number of hydrogen projects uh, that we are involved in, mainly these days in Germany, the Netherlands, and the UK, um, where we work uh, together with prominent partners from industry and the scientific community. Um, and all this uh, is still um, also with, with a necessity of, of some support. And the projects that are here marked with a with a red uh, circle, those have been nominated now as uh, uh, shortlisted for uh, an even further funding on the European level that will be jointly decided by the European uh, Commission and by Norway, uh, interestingly. So uh, another great example, and, and for example, the Aquaventus uh, project family on the island of Heligoland is, is also an initiative where uh, Equinor is part of and, and where we can uh, demonstrate that uh, offshore wind and hydrogen uh, can closely work together uh, to facilitate uh, the, the, the new Green Deal uh, in the European Commission. So in a nutshell, uh, to me, uh, it remains offshore is great and we should make it happen happen uh, jointly together um, all over Europe, but uh, obviously, especially now these days in Norway. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Matthiesen. Um, very interesting to hear uh, uh, you speak and to hear uh, what you have to say on um, the range, the whole range of uh, uh, your projects. Um, I think it's time we try to bring Mr. Eich back in. Are you there? Yes, do you hear me now? Yes, we hear you. Loud and clear. Fantastic. Very good. Thank you very much. And thank you very much for, for the invitation. And it's, uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. And uh, it's, of course, also a great pleasure to, to come after, after Holger Matthiesen. So, um, so I'm really looking forward to this. Um, I will focus on offshore wind in Norway and the opportunities for, for German-Norwegian collaboration on, on offshore wind in my eight minutes. But just let's dwell a little bit on uh, what we have uh, achieved together, Germany and Norway, when it comes to uh, the energy cooperation. I think that can be described probably by, by three words. It's a long-standing cooperation for more than 40 years. It's a solid one. And it's very much, as we've already seen from, from Holger as well, it's a, it's a forward-looking uh, cooperation. We have the uh, integrated European gas infrastructure system, um, which is, of course, crucial. And I think also when we, when we start looking into offshore wind, maybe there are things to be learned from, from that. Uh, the interconnector Nord uh, Nordlink, uh, which was open uh, last week, uh, was very important. Um, uh, carbon capture and storage, uh, we are together with Total and Shell involved in a, in a storage project called Northern Light. 
And uh, uh, the first CO2 that will come into that, that uh, storage part will be uh, from Norsem in, in Norway. And that is owned by the German company uh, Heidelberg. And, and they're also looking for, for other CO2 sources in, in Europe. So that's a very interesting uh, example on, on cooperation as well. Um, hydrogen, both on the blue side, uh, we are exploring opportunities on blue hydrogen with ThyssenKrupp. And as, as Holger already mentioned, there is a, quite a few things also happening, happening on the green hydrogen side between Germany and Norway. And obviously offshore wind, already mentioned Arcona, a fantastic German-Norwegian uh, project. And as I will get back to, we will also do our utmost to get uh, a project at, at Surly and offshore too. Uh, let's let's look a bit uh, where we are on offshore wind uh, at, at the moment in, in, in Norway. Uh, Hyven Tampen will come uh, online uh, late next year. 88 megawatts and will be the world's largest floating offshore wind farm at that point in time. But this is just the beginning. And uh, as you, you have already heard, new areas for offshore wind in Norway is opening. Utsiranur, which is also for floating offshore wind. And then uh, Surly Norsha too, uh, where we expect maybe the first project to come a little bit later than at, at Utsiranur. Uh, and we think, at least for the moment, that that is uh, most likely a bottom-fixed offshore wind project. Uh, and as you can see, from 2030 onwards, we expect a large increase of offshore wind in Norwegian seawater. Um, when it comes to well, where is the power going to go, that's always a, a discussion and a good question. I think uh, a large chunk of this will go, go to Europe and, uh, and maybe to, to Germany as well. Uh, but there could also be opportunities for, for power export to Norway in a bit uh, longer term, uh, even though Norway has an energy surplus at, at the moment. Uh, hydrogen, great opportunity for, for offshore wind, uh, obviously. Um, and then I'm just going to talk a little bit about hybrid projects. This is the, maybe the, the new kid on the block when it comes to to offshore wind. So we have been uh, in an era now where we have uh, uh, radial connections, meaning that we have one offshore wind farm going to one connection point in, in, in the home market. But now we see more and more uh, a movement towards hybrid projects, meaning that the wind farm could go to more than one market. And also we will see development of so-called mesh grids and, uh, and even energy hubs as, as illustrated here. So why is this, or why does this make sense? Um, uh, it's, it's more efficient use of area. If you, for example, look again at, uh, to Germany, and if you look at the massive ambition Germany has on offshore wind, uh, it could be that uh, uh, being connected to international offshore wind project would be make it easier for Germany to, to achieve this, given that there might be some limitation on, on acreage, for example. Well, cooperation on this could, could get us further. Uh, improved grid efficiency, instead of having one cable to, to each project, you could see that by, by putting uh, wind farms and countries together, you could lower, lower the cost. Obviously, for, for wind developers like, like RWE and, and Equinor, we would, by doing this, have access to more than one market, multiple markets, and also to secure flexibility and, and also the potential storage through green hydrogen would uh, perhaps be easier with uh, with hybrid projects. But of course, uh, and we know it, Europe is looking for 300 gigawatt of offshore wind by 2050 in order to, to meet the climate and CO2 emission reduction targets. And, and looking uh, to Norway and, uh, and the North Sea is obviously very important to, to achieve that. Um, in a kind of a perfect world, you could put up this, this whole offshore grid first and then you connect all the wind farm. That's not going to happen. This is going to be a stepwise development. You will have one project, one hybrid project, you would add another one, and then you will uh, find ways to connecting them together on the long term. And that's also why it's so important that, that you establish a, a standardized infrastructure, have the same, same uh, rules, 
regulations and standards for HFD, HEDC cables and, and so on. Uh, just a, uh, a minute on uh, on Sörli Norsha too, and, and Holger has already uh, mentioned it. Uh, what we think this should be is a large hybrid project. We see that it could potentially be connected to Germany, um, along with Norway and, and possibly other countries. This is, of course, something we are assessing and looking into to now. But Germany uh, would need more renewable power. They would probably need offshore wind project from abroad. And uh, there is a strong connection between Germany and Norway already. So we definitely see Germany as, a, as one, one option for, for power off it. Very important that this is um, uh, it's an optimum utilization in terms of infrastructure. Um, and we think, as already mentioned, that the uh, RWE, Hydro and Equinor is a, is a strong and complementary partnership. We are two of the major developers and operators of offshore wind. We have huge power market experiences. Uh, and we, we also have a strong position and a network in both Norway, EU and and also the UK. Uh, North Sea experiences with various uh, offshore wind projects, but also, of course, being in, uh, in oil and gas for, for quite some time, and, and been uh, working with Norwegian, German, and international industry, and, and the supply chain uh, is something we think will be, will be very important uh, going forward. So I think that was it from my side. Hopefully it was about eight, eight minutes. Thanks a lot, Mr. Eich. We heard you loud and clear, and we could see your presentation, which was uh, great. So uh, you will be joining us. Uh, Mr. Matisen will as well be joining us in the Q&A session in a few minutes. But uh, we jump right into the next presentation by Mr. Tom Pedersen from uh, Siemens Gamesa. He has been in the uh, wind industry since 1985 and is currently sales director at Siemens Gamesa and has responsibility for several major customers as well as Norway. And he will share his thoughts on how we should think offshore wind and hydrogen production in combination, among others. I see you have the presentation ready and I hope I can also hear you. Please go ahead. So. <clears throat> hydrogen has been mentioned a couple of times in this uh, uh, in, in the presentations today. I would like to share uh, the Siemens Gamesa perspective um, on that subject. Visions for offshore renewable energy production. Visions are not new. Visions uh, have been around for a long time, and in 1847, Jules Verne in his book, The Mysterious Island, envisioned a world where water will one day be employed as fuel. Hydrogen and oxygen used singly or together will furnish an inexhaustible source of heat and light of an intensity of which coal is not capable. I really like that quote, but uh, Mr. Mr. Van was, was too modest um, because uh, Hydrogen is much more than light and heat. In the world of uh, Siemens Gamesa, we are uh, approaching this in, in various ways. One of the um, one is for, for offshore, which is the subject of today, but uh, the baby steps we're currently taking onshore. So why was why was Jules Verne too modest? Well, hydrogen is actually a raw material from which many of the things society will need in uh, its uh, move to a more sustainable world. Um, if you mix it with biogas, you can get methane. If you um, if you uh, mix it with uh, with carbon monoxide, uh, you'll get green fuels. You can do use it directly for transportation, in steel mills, uh, uh, for the gas grid or in industry. We can even make plastics out of it. And of course, uh, mixed with, uh, with uh, nitrogen, we can make ammonia, um, which can be used for ship propulsion. 
it can be used to, and already is used for for fertilizers you name it so so hydrogen is kind of something that can be used in many many uh, aspects of our lives if it is cheap because if it's too expensive it won't work so so the seems camisa take on this is that we need to make sure that this is affordable for the world in the offshore environment we are looking at basically uh, three different scenarios if you like for for generating uh, hydrogen scenario one to the left you'll see that uh, this is this is more or less uh, a standard offshore uh, wind power plant uh, with uh, interray cables between the turbines uh, substation on offshore um, shore cables and hydrolyzer or electrolysis on shore it is technology that's already there and um, you know it's basically plug and play a um, bit of work has to be done on the electrolysis but uh, but it's it's almost there and ready to go export cables are very expensive and uh, the losses are not insignificant even though um, we are talking about very high voltages so um, the medium step or the intermediate step could be uh, to place the electrolysis in the offshore environment and then simply run a, a, a gas pipe to shore but the one that we as a as a turbine supplier can influence and which we believe is 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 the right way to go uh, at least uh, maybe not in the short term but at least in the medium and long term is to let the turbines produce hydrogen directly so you can see now that um, to the to the right hand side in scenario three that um, that there are no more cables no more electricity cables but there are only pipes in the interarray and also for the export cables this will of course not happen um, from day one so uh, the first baby steps we're now taking uh, in uh, near our, our turbine factory in Denmark um, where we've set up a test plant on an existing turbine a direct drive seems camisa uh, three megawatt machine we have uh, coupled it up or connected it with a, an electrolyzer a 400 kV electrolyzer with some intermediate storage um, compressor station and um, and um, and a filling station where we can where we can sort of export the uh, produced hydrogen in bottles that you see here why are we doing this well this is, as I say, the first step on the way to figuring out exactly how do we how do we produce hydrogen directly on the turbine. So we're testing different operation modes. We're basically operating the turbine in island mode, so cutting the electric cables and only producing hydrogen. Why is this difficult? Well, Hydrolyzers today are not really capable of coping with the very variable electricity input that comes from a wind turbine. So this has to be fixed somehow, either by evening out the, uh, the flow of electrons from the turbine or by enabling the hydrolyzing plant to um, accept um, the variable uh, input. We can also operate it in a grid connected mode where we export electricity when the price is high and produce hydrogen when the price is low which is another option that this affords and why do we do that well at the moment an electricity producing turbine goes through a lot of steps uh, you can see in the sketch conventional wind turbine will um, produce AC uh, with the generator we convert it to DC we convert it back to AC we step it up with a transformer we step it even further up offshore 
we step it down again, we convert the AC to DC, and then we feed and electrolyze onshore. That's a lot of steps with a lot of losses. And the, in a dedicated hydrogen turbine, we can basically cut out at least 10% of those losses. So that's why we're doing it. What would this look like in, uh, in the real world? Well, <clears throat> this is what we are trying to explore together with uh, our, our colleagues, amongst others, in the Aquaventus project that was uh, mentioned before. Um, so um, so um, instead of having all the electric uh, conversions and so on in the, in the turbine, we will simply place electrolyzers uh, at the platform in the offshore environment. We will uh, have a desalination plant and water purification plant there, and the turbine will be generating electricity for its own use, um, DC for the electrolyzers, and what comes out at the bottom is a pipe that come there with 35 bar hydrogen. So, um, so very much simpler set up, in our opinion. You can then ask, is it worthwhile? And um, the, um, the small calculation at the lower right-hand corner of this basically shows that one of our standard turbines, uh, if it was rigged for this, would produce approximately 1,100 tons of hydrogen per year. 1,100 tons may not say many of us, you know, may not mean much to any of us, but um, but if we know that, uh, if we try to convert it into something that we can understand, then, uh, then uh, an array of 15 of these turbines would produce enough hydrogen to run almost two and a half thousand normal uh, heavy trucks for a year. It would fuel two container ships a year, or it could um, um, it could feed a refinery with uh, the required amount of uh, hydrogen for its operation for a year. 15 turbines. So, so it is definitely worthwhile. So, um, <clears throat> As I started out by saying, there are many visions in this. Schulz Wern had one dream. Uh, we have another. We believe that this is possible, and uh, and uh, we are working diligently to put the first hydrogen turbine in the water in a few years. Thank you very much. And I hope. Thank you very much, Mr. Pedersen. Um, we now have time for a few questions and a short discussion with you, Mr. Ike and uh, Mr. Matisen. Uh, I think we could start with a question from uh, from the audience, uh, to Christian. Yes, there was um, a question for um, RWE and uh, Equinor on uh, the new project um, concerning state subsidies. And the question was, will your project need state subsidies to be uh, commercially viable? Perhaps um, you would like to begin, Mr. Eich. Maybe, maybe I should start, uh, Holger, and uh, feel free to, to, to elaborate. So what, what we have said on, on, uh, on this is that we should be able to operate the wind farm uh, relying on, on the market price and, and uh, and no subsidies from the Norwegian government when it comes to wind farm as such. However, we of course need to look into how to finance the infrastructure, the HVDC cables. We have not said that we will necessarily cover all that ourselves. So, but as for the wind farm, we've said that we are not expecting any subsidies from the Norwegian government. Um, then let's jump to uh, another question, also from the audience, uh, to Siemens Gamesa. Um, will your concept make it superfluous to convert oil platforms offshore to hydrogen hubs because your solution will be more efficient? We believe that there is a room for, for all, uh, all of the three uh, scenarios that I showed. It is not, uh, it's not only one 
uh, one uh, one size fits all here. Uh, if you build from scratch in what could be called a, a green field or a blue field, I guess it is offshore, then uh, then it might be more uh, efficient to uh, to use the hydrogen producing turbines. Whereas if you already have infrastructure in place, well, why not take advantage of that and uh, and use that? So um, so so I, I I see it as a, as a as a, a question of of every project um, has to be uh, designed on its own merit. Thank you. Um, I think we should continue uh, on the topic of uh, regulation. Uh, we heard you talk about uh, hybrid projects, and uh, let's start with you, Holger Mathiesen. Um, in your opinion, uh, what must be in place, both in terms of regulation and on the technical side, uh, to be able to set up energy islands and uh, other hybrid projects? So um, to, to me, it's it's quite exciting because um, the combination of offshore wind with other, let's call it, ingredients like, for example, energy islands or also hydrogen, is is to me something that illustrates that large infrastructure changes only work if if a lot of players do come together, and and to me, there there is obviously the necessity for. Um, a regulatory framework, but this basically uh, comes along uh, and shapes almost automatically if if a lot of reputable players that are motivated to make it happen are coming together and work on the topic itself. And and to me, uh, the examples that were already mentioned are are perfect examples, like the Aquaventus initiative in Germany, for example. Where, where a lot of players do come together and, and try to make it work. And then I think uh, the, the past uh, has shown that it then also will work out in the end. Thank you. Um, Anna Eich, would you also comment on this? Yeah, I, I very much agree with Holger on this. And I think uh, this is also a matter of operation between governments, between industry, between TSO and between many, many suppliers and everyone. So I think having a vision of thinking this as broad and big and not kind of uh, just sub-optimization each and every project, I think that is the starting point. And if we look at the uh, EU strategy for, for offshore wind that came out in, in November, this is exactly how, they, how they're thinking uh, around that as well. So I think if we can, can manage to to build on that and if we can get the political will and if we can get the standards and if we can get this uh, up and running uh, fairly soon, I'm, I'm very, very positive to towards uh, uh, offshore offshore grid in, in the North Sea and, and uh, both energy hubs and, and, uh, and um, hybrid projects. So, but let's not make uh, perfect uh, the enemy of the good here. We, we need to get started maybe with individual projects but we need to have a vision of, of this as big long term. Thank you. Mr. Pedersen, would you like to comment uh, regulations and uh, uh, technology? What do you see as, uh, as necessary to, to get in place here? Well, <clears throat> I don't think I can add much to what has been said already. I mean, it, uh, it is, of course, super important that, uh, that, that when energy islands are planned, that all the elements are taken into consideration. So, so I see this. Um, I'm not a developer, project developer, but I see it as a, as a, as a range of hills. You know, you get over one hill, and then you see the next one, and then you see the next one. The only people who can actually overview all of that is uh, are the politicians and uh, and and the organisations uh, um, who sit with all of those individual elements. So, in an, uh, in 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 the in the current Energy Island, which is uh, now being planned in, in Denmark. Um, maybe they'll call it the mysterious island. I don't know. Then uh, they, <laughs> you know, they, they are trying to do exactly that. And, uh, and, and, and this is a first in many respects. So I'm sure we will get lost at some stage, but I'm also sure that the political will is there to make this happen. 
so so when um, bottlenecks or, or or problems are identified then they can be solved very quickly because um, Anna Eich said let's uh, let's not make uh, perfect uh, the the enemy of, of, of good and uh, and I think this is very much an example of of, of us creating an industry as we move forward so um, so we will make mistakes and mis and uh, but but if the will is there to solve them as we hit them then then I'm very pragmatic about that yeah I think we have uh, one uh, final question from uh, from the audience uh, as well um, yes, um, yes, this question was sent to us in advance, um, and the question uh, is, I think, uh, mostly directed to Mr. Anna Eik from Equinor, and it states, why should the Norwegian continental shelf be used to produce renewable energy for consumption in continental Europe? So perhaps you, Mr. Eik, could just answer, and we'll see if uh, Mr. Matisen and uh, Pedersen um, also has some comments afterwards. Mm. No, I, I think I mean we should look upon this as an opportunity for for Norway and opportunity for for Norwegian and European industry. And uh, uh, of course, if uh, if you look at again, for example, for, for Germany, they they would need a whole lot of offshore wind going forward, and we think that looking also outside the national border of Germany would be an opportunity for them as well. So, so I think this could be a win-win situation both from, for Norway and, and also uh, for Germany. And, but also, as I mentioned, I think uh, if we look at Sörle and Orsha too again, in, uh, in the post-2030 perspective, it could also be that Norway would uh, benefit from having, uh, having offshore wind uh, uh, to their country. So. So I think uh, this this we need to look at, and uh, but I I do think that uh, a close collaboration between Norway and Germany on on offshore wind uh, as well as uh, interconnectors uh, like Northlink is is definitely the way we will uh, we will see this this move. Yeah, may, maybe I can add to that, um, and and I'm not sure the question was why. Uh, should the Norwegian continental shelf produce renewable energies, right? Uh, and, and my answer, my blunt answer would be because it can. I mean, this is this is a super large area with excellent wind conditions, uh, modest uh, uh, water depths um, in, in the middle of Europe, I, I should say, or, or northern Europe. Uh, so, so this is the perfect place to to build offshore wind farms in the in the European perspective, uh, as as Arno already outlined, and uh, I'm, I'm I'm also personally excited that the Norwegian government now starts this journey, and and as Tom already said, there will be mistakes uh, to be made, but but uh, but to me this is entirely positive because it illustrates that something is uh, is ongoing. In the right direction of of um, establishing more renewable energy production, and that is, I think, what we need uh, in Norway, in Germany, in Europe, and and also globally. Thank you all three for joining this discussion. Um, I uh, wrote down a few key words on uh, joining forces and. Uh, a strong complementary competence uh, between Norway and Ger Germany on this uh, um, on this field. So uh, thank you very much, uh, all three of you. We now move on to the final session of the day, uh, where we have invited two offshore wind cluster organizations, and they will provide their thoughts on the potential synergy effects of more cooperation between between uh, Germany and Norway on concrete projects. First up. We have uh, Ms. Heike Winkler. She is the managing director at the Offshore Wind uh, Industry Association and Innovation Cluster WAB in Bremerhaven, which she has been leading since, two, since 2019. Ms. Winkler, are you there? Uh, I really look forward to hear your thoughts on the potential for further German Norwegian cooperation on offshore wind. It's, it's a great pleasure for me to join uh, this exchange, this dialogue today. And uh, 
we as a, as a association and cluster, um, we, we are always looking for that kind of uh, cooperation opportunities to, to learn from one another and uh, to uh, speed up uh, certain developments when it relates to offshore wind. The topic today, um, just a moment, whoop, this. Um, technology needs and opportunities in research and development gives a lot of uh, different um, anchors to, to um, get close to the direction of development for offshore wind, green hydrogen and floating activities. About us, we are, um, as you said, in, based in Bremerhaven since 2002, an association working for the development of offshore wind. We are also a network in the northwest region of Germany for onshore wind companies, and we have um, companies from maritime industry and institutes uh, research activities and um, in in our um, um, our, uh, as our members um, we are always looking forward uh, when it comes to the development of complete cost efficient value chains um, not only for offshore wind also in the onshore wind industry and now um, we are trying to support the emerging market of green hydrogen in germany and other regions related to offshore wind um, we see in, when it comes to uh, the possibility of um, R&D opportunities, um, that this is based within VAP in our working groups. So we have different working groups where we try to connect also with different industry clusters, not only in Germany. Um, and uh, we are trying to match companies together um, that are um, helpful for each other to develop certain topics. It's all about power distribution, green hydrogen, onshore wind and offshore wind. As you can see, we are also looking for topics like recycling, which might be an interesting topic for R&D opportunities as well. Uh, we are always exchanging once in a year in our offshore wind conference. Um, we are doing this this year in October again, and this is always an international platform also with Norwegian representatives, and we are always very happy um, to have them there to see their innovative solution and ideas. To give an overview about uh, some of our members, uh, I didn't put now all the logos on the slide, but just for you to have an impression. Um, most of the member companies or very much of the member companies are already uh, international players. Um, but, for example, SME um, companies within Germany sometimes are uh, located only in Germany and they are really benefiting from a, from a proper cooperation. We see that we have certain goals to reach. In Germany, at least 20 gigawatt by 2030 and 40 gigawatt by 2040. And as uh, Gunnar Herzig mentioned in the beginning, there is a lot of uh, um, opportunities for cooperation and also to uh, learn from uh, the different national experiences and developments. And when it comes to green hydrogen, we are just uh, at a starting point. And uh, we um, would love to benefit from different uh, lessons learned within the industry, also in the Norwegian industry with a strong oil and gas background. And we see that um, when innovative offshore wind supply chains match together, um, that it's always something that uh, can really um, fasten the speed of the development. 
uh, when it comes to uh, hydrogen, we see that there is a rapid increase of demand, and uh, we um, see also that it might be a, a link development uh, also to floating power plants. Um, we think there is still a lot of uh, investigation needed in terms of hydrogen transport logistics or pipelines, and that might be also a topic uh, where uh, both uh, countries can uh, profit from each uh, experience. And um, there are things to be solved, as we learned also in the presentations before, like uh, when it comes to desalination uh, regarding the electrolyzers, when it comes to green shipping, SUVs, CTVs, there are a lot of topics um, where we think that uh, exchange might be helpful. Um, on the right side, you see this topic special planning, and it's... Um, it can also relate uh, to uh, aqua culture co-using uh, actions um, that still needs to be developed, um, finding together uh, solutions, uh, protecting biodiversity and uh, working on uh, protective solutions for climate and also for offshore wind installation. We have at the moment just two uh, small uh, areas destined for green hydrogen and offshore wind that are discussed on a political level right now. Um, a bigger one in the North Sea and a very small one in the Baltic Sea, but I, I think we are just at the beginning and there will be um, a fast development to come to reach the goals. Nordlink was mentioned, or Northlink was mentioned several times, but we see also uh, R&D opportunities uh, when it comes to infrastructure topics, smart energy distribution um, in research and development on an academic level. Um, regarding uh, floating offshore wind technologies, and uh, we will hear, I think, um, more about this, science qualification training, and as I mentioned, exchanges on lessons learned would be very helpful from our perspective. And that would be a, a short presentation now from my side, and I really hope that there are questions, and I'm really looking forward to the presentation of my Norwegian colleague. Thanks a lot, uh, Ms. Winkler. And you will be with us in a few minutes for a few questions. We now move on uh, to the last speaker of the day, uh, Mats Aril Verde. He is project leader at the Norwegian Offshore Wind Cluster, where he oversees and facilitates the demonstration of new co concepts at the Marine Energy Test Center in Norway. Coming from a technical background, he also has extensive experience uh, from uh, management and business development in the oil and gas and maritime industries before transitioning into offshore wind. So, uh, <laughs> Mr. Vere, please go ahead when you're ready. Are you there? Thank you. And thank you for the invitation to uh, present uh, with you. Let me just bring up my presentation. I've got five minutes, so please excuse any um, if I skip some vital points. Um, yes, uh, the Norwegian offshore wind cluster is uh, currently consisting of 200 and more. Well, today, I think it's 87 members. Uh, ranging from uh, companies like Equinor and Arca Solution down to SMBs and uh, small scale startups. Um, and of course, we're delivering through the whole uh, delivery chain. This is uh, also within the ambition and to do establish a Norwegian a global supply chain from Norway of floating offshore wind farms. Um, as said, one of the focus areas is to develop a Norwegian supply chain um, and, of course, also to, to uh, 
make room for innovation, for new concepts, um, make uh, test capacities and demos available. We're also working with the international markets. We have uh, some uh, cooperation with uh, other European clusters. We, um, well, we have our own EU advisor in the cluster to, to facilitate that uh, EU connection. Um, and of course, the development of the Utsula North and uh, Southern North Sea 2 is uh, something we are, are involved in. Um, just a quick word about the demo project at Met Center. Uh, the Unitic Safaris you might know as the high wind demo, uh, still operating at, um, at Met Center. Uh, but then now owned by a company called Unitec. Um, the Makani we had in 2019, unfortunately that was uh, ended by the owners. We expect Tetra Spa to come in this summer, um, or it will hopefully come in this summer uh, in, in July. Uh, this is based on the SDSL Tetra Spa concept. C12 and flagship will arrive in uh, in 2022, where C12 has this uh, innovative uh, vertical axis wind turbine, and uh, flagship, well, I guess you all know, will uh, be a 10 plus megawatt floating wind turbine. And the uh, main goal here is to have as low LCOE as possible. We are also working on an uh, extension, and just this week, we uh, or last week, we had uh, a go from the Ministry of uh, Petroleum and Energy uh, for the extension. We still have to do, to do the concession uh, application, but but uh, at least we have a go from the ministry. Uh, and as you see, the extended content will be uh, 85 megawatts, which is very close to what will be at High Wind Tumpen at 88 and greatly, well, bigger than uh, the High Wind Scotland. If we have all the turbines running all, all the time, of course. Uh, the, uh, we are most looking for floating offshore wind, but we also will also um, plan to facilitate for floating solar, hydrogen production, and stuff like that. Um, yes, just uh, it's a bit of an exploded view, but uh, the Met Center is located, as you can see. Uh, turbines down to the right, um, and uh, it's very close to Utsal North, and will give well a similar, if not the same, uh, weather conditions uh, as that. And then, what's the opportunities for German companies in Norway? Um, I think um, Germany is way ahead of Norway uh, with competence on, on wind power uh, from land and bottom fixed turbines. And as mentioned before, the Norwegian companies has a long and proven competence from the oil and gas business, knowledge of floaters and, and, and uh, generally from an industrial perspective. And I really think these are complementary knowledges. Um, and it's also been mentioned a bit earlier that uh, Norway has a surplus of energy and really doesn't need to, to produce more, more electricity. But, and, and as such, it, it's regarded as in this, well, a stepping stone to, to, for the industry to, to, to build that up. And uh, I think my best advice for the German companies to, to enter the Norwegian market is to enter into corporations with Norwegian companies. And we already see that from RWE, Eon, and other companies um, doing that. So 
best, um, I think my best advice for the German companies would be to enter into any cooperation. And of course, we will be happy to facilitate any connection between our members and, and the companies uh, from Germany. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Vedoy, for this uh, short presentation. Um, as I said, uh, yeah, good, uh, good introduction, but also a good advice in the end here on uh, for the German companies entering the Norwegian market. Um, maybe start with one short question for you first. Um, how do you see that Norway can uh, accelerate its offshore wind growth uh, strategy? Um, good question. Uh, well, I, I think that what we are all waiting for now is the guidelines coming from the uh, from the ministry and uh, government, uh, which will come the the eleventh, I think. And um, I, I think we need to enter into cooperation with international providers and uh, and operators because, well, we have a certain knowledge and which is quite good, it, it's, uh, it, it's very good, but still we lack some and that we have to get somewhere. And it, well, in, in this globalized world, it, it doesn't make sense to start doing everything ourselves. So going to strategic, um, Cooperation, I think it's it's a key uh, key element in in Norway's uh, offshore wind strategy. Thank you, uh, Heike Winkler. You are also still uh, with us. Uh, I have a follow up question for you uh, as well. Uh, Germany has a longer uh, has longer experience uh, in the offshore wind industry. And what would, in, in your opinion, uh, what can Norway uh, learn from Germany's experience? And then, I mean, both on the success side, but also maybe on uh, the key challenges uh, from, from the German market. I hope I understood everything correctly, um, but I think um, uh, we can learn a lot uh, from each other, let me put it that way. We have a lot of experience in offshore wind. Um, Denmark got more. So uh, offshore wind has been right from the beginning always an international business uh, based on international exchange. And maybe one thing that is very important, if you ramp up a supply chain and offshore wind industry, then it's very important to have a steady pipeline. It does not make sense to have a huge uh, project pipeline for one, two years, and afterwards uh, you, you have no clue how to continue. That's a very important experience from Germany. Um, and another thing is we profit a lot from uh, good collaboration in between small companies and big companies. That means um, it's very helpful um, to have some some kind of this working groups uh, solutions in place to always uh, give some transparency on each project development. And that's also interesting then on an international level and also in exchange with Norwegian companies from my perspective. Thank you so much. Before we uh, have to round up, I think we could take uh, one last question from uh, the audience. Yes. There was one more question that I think we should cover before we end the day. And um, the question is, do you think there should be a German-Norwegian energy island flagship project? And I believe that uh, we're here thinking of a similar project that Germany and Denmark uh, has uh, initiated. That's certainly always a very uh, progressive and good uh, solution for a fast cooperation, but uh, that must come then from the political side or, uh, you know, there must be a tender for such a joint project. So if there is one, it would be a brilliant step forward in terms of cooperation in between Norwegian and German companies in my eyes. And Mr. Verde? Well, uh, I think uh, for the concept of the energy island, I, I think that should be uh, an imaginary one, so to speak. Uh, 
I'm not sure if it's if it's the best solution to build a physical island, but but uh, to see um, what you'd call it, uh, a cooperation between the two markets um, or the two countries at a greater scale. Yes, I think that would be beneficiary for all, all parties. Well then, uh, We're approaching um, 11.30 and uh, it's time time to round up. So we thank uh, Ms. Winkler and Ms. Mr. Verde uh, for participating. We also thank the other speakers uh, that have presented and uh, discussed today. We thank the audience for following this webinar. And we, of course, uh, thank our partners, uh, Agda Anashi, DNV, Equinor, Hydro, Renew, uh, RWE uh, Renewables, Startcraft, Startnet, and Tenet. And before we uh, end today, I'd like to also mention that there is still time to sign up for the last webinar in this webinar series, which takes place on next Monday uh, on structural change in the European energy sector. In this webinar, we will also cover the topic of uh, offshore grids more in detail. So that might be of interest to some of our viewers. And if you w wish to see the program, you can do that by uh, uh, going to uh, german-norwegian.energy. By that, it's time to say Hadebra. And Auf Wiedersehen.